Good evening. Good evening. Again, we are blessed and privileged to be able to come, to be able to be led by Paul in such wonderful songs, to be led in prayer so beautifully, to study God's word, to worship our great God who loves us and cares for us. And as you guys know, we've been going over here on Sunday nights a series of lessons looking that therein at 1 Corinthians, this great letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church there at Corinth, wherein the church, though it was struggling and was divided in many ways, when we look at this great book, there are so many doctrinal realities and discussions that go on that it is a great book to study, learn from, and gain knowledge of God and the expectations from him. And as you and I know, and as we've talked about, the theme verse of this particular book is found by Paul there in 1 Corinthians 2, 1 and 2, where Paul says, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come, proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. How do divisions, how do uh, issues that can arise in a congregation get fixed, get corrected? How can unity once again be found? Paul says it's in Christ and knowing him only and looking to him only. Today we find ourselves continuing in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 last week we looked at the first five verses and started to examine or examined unrighteous judgment there, where Paul discusses and talks with the church in Corinth there of the dangers of judging one improperly or not according to God. We see where we cannot condemn where God has not. We studied and noticed we cannot judge uh, with partiality, we must be impartial and equally judged, uh, judge all and everyone. And that we must slowly and thoroughly, before making a judgment, make sure we are right according to God's word in that area. With that being said, we find ourselves then in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6, where Paul, based on that reality of what we just talked about, would write this, I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one, of one against another. Again, here Paul gives us a vital and important truth concerning God's word and how it helps us guides us and prevents us from becoming divided, not to go beyond what is written. So we're going to talk tonight about adding and subtracting from God's word. We're going to look at the idea, at least how humans get caught up in this reality. When we think of the world around us, when we think of what God has said concerning this, you and I know God has not being quiet on this subject. Throughout the scriptures, God has said, don't add to what I said. Don't take away from what I have said. We see this Deuteronomy chapter four and verse two, you shall not add to the word I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I commanded you. In Proverbs 30 and verse six, we read this, do not add to his, that's God's words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. Paul, of course, we all remember what he said to the churches of Galatia in his letter to them in chapter 1 and verse 8. But even if we, the apostles or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. Paul said, listen, if we add to... We take away from God's word. If it's not God's word, then we're in danger of being accursed. We're in danger of being rebuked by God and called a liar concerning 
his word. That's why it's so important that we understand not adding to and subtracting from his word. Now, again, you and I are abundantly aware that this has been going on for a long time. When we look back at the history of denominationalism, Catholicism years ago established the idea that they themselves have the authority to change God's word, to add to it or subtract it however they feel fitting. Later during the uh, restoration movement with Luther and Zwingli and others, they fought against this idea of Catholicism, but in so doing and trying to restore what uh, they saw as being good and true, they ended up creating denominationalism as we see it today in many ways. With one group saying, well, I believe this, and another group saying, well, I believe God teaches this, and both contradicting each other, and yet at the same time saying all will go to heaven. So adding to and subtracting from God's word to make it fit man's desires is nothing new. And yet, as we look across the church, you and I are also unfortunately aware and sadly aware that many of our own brethren have got caught up in this, have fallen victim to this illogical and nonsensical ideology. Concerning what God has said on not adding to nor taking away from his word, when we think of this reality, we have to ask ourselves, how do we guard against that? How do we keep ourselves from accidentally, if you will, or, or uh, coming to an idea that adds to God's word or subtracts from God's word? How do we keep ourselves when we listen to preachers and teachers teach from God's word, how do we know that they haven't added to or they haven't subtracted from God's holy word? How do we make sure, in other words, that we're not tossed to and fro by the waves and winds of human cunningness and deceitful doctrines, Ephesians 4, 11 through 14? We do this by making sure we guard our spiritual ears. What do I mean by that? When additions and subtractions from God's holy word creep in, we need to be able to hear it spiritually. We need to be able to see when those things are taken away or when those things are added. And understanding that, is vital to our Christian walk. So with that in mind, if you have your hand out, let's look at our first point this evening. Mankind throughout history has found itself hearing God differently. Denominationalism is by far an abundant truth to this, but Jesus declared this very reality in a very uh, well-known parable that you and I are familiar with when he talked about four different hearers when it comes to God's word. In Luke chapter 8, again, we find a very famous parable. I want us this evening to look at Luke chapter 8, and let's look at verses 5 through 8 at this moment. Jesus would teach, A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot. And birds of the air devoured it, and some fell on the rock. And as it grew up, it withered away, because it had no moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up, and it choked it out. And some fell into good soil, and grew and yielded a hundredfold. And as he said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. A little later, the disciples came to Jesus and said, we don't quite understand. We couldn't hear properly, in other words. We weren't sure what exactly you're getting at. So Jesus would tell them in verses 11 through 15, the meaning of that parable. 
Now the parable is this, he said, the seed is the word of God. The ones along the path are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the words from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. And the ones on the rocks are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy, but these have no root. They believe for a while and in time of testing fall away. And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life. And the fruit does not mature. As for that in the good soil, they are those who hear the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. Jesus declares not only in the parable, but the explanation of the parable for different hearers. He recognizes and points out, listen, the first one is an uninterested hearer. The second is a deficient hearer. The third is a thorn-infested hearer. And of course, the fourth is a good hearer. Let's take a moment and look at each of these hearers, if you will. What about that unintentional, or excuse me, uninterested hearer? These are the ones who hear the word of God, but ultimately are not interested in what God says. The devil can quickly come and take the word of God out of their heart, because they don't and are not interested in really what God has to say. Now, history is replete with examples of this. One of the great ones is found in Genesis chapter 6 through Genesis chapter 9. Remember, in Genesis chapter 6, you have Noah, and the rest of the world is sinful and evil. And yet, when we look at 2 Peter 2 and verse 5, we see Noah was preaching to the people. And only his family was actually interested in what God had to say. The rest of those who heard the word of God, the rest of those who heard Noah preaching and teaching what God would have them to know and, and what God would have them to uh, hear and, and do to have salvation, they simply weren't interested in it. They heard it. You don't preach to no one. They heard it, but they weren't interested. It's a dangerous reality, but it is true. There are a large number of people who hear God's word, but unfortunately, they simply are not interested in what God has to say. What about that second hearer Jesus mentioned? The deficient hearer, if you will. These are those who hear the word of God, but never move beyond the most basic, basic doctrines and are easily swept away by those that will tickle their ears. We see this in the church at Pergam in Revelation chapter 2. Here you have the church. They had obeyed the gospel. They had heard the word. They had come to God in joy, but because they were deficient in their willingness to really get to know God and, and be involved with him and to really know his word and, and listen to those who would proclaim his word and were only simply immature babes. They got caught up in false doctrines, those who would add to and take away from God's word. In Revelation 2, 14 and 15, Jesus says this to the church of Pergamum. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. They had, because they were deficient hearers to God's word, because they didn't listen to God on the importance of growing and maturing and developing, as they should in him, they had fallen victim. Those tickling their ears, those who would tell them what they wanted to hear, those who would add to or subtract from God's word, as Satan so easily does, and his uh, demons and teachers and preachers and ministers. 
get people to believe as Eve, she would not surely die. We have to be careful that when we listen to God and hear his word, we're not deficient in it. And yet many are, unfortunately. Thirdly, the third hero we see there in Luke chapter 8 are those who are thorn in infested here. These are those who never actually give up their sinful baggage from the past. Yes, they're excited about the reality of what God can do for them. They want to go to heaven and they want the all the benefits and blessings of a Savior as we've used that before without any of the reality of a Lord or Master. And they hold and bring with them baggage that is not based in God's word, but is found throughout their own past. And they add it or subtract it from God's word. Everything is filtered through that baggage. Again, we find another example of this in the Judaizing teachers, don't we? In Acts chapter 15, we see this crop up for the first time in Scripture. These Pharisees who had obeyed the gospel... But instead of doing what God has said, instead of listening to Paul and Barnabas even, as these apostles, this apostle and those who had been with him in all these missionary journeys and taught all these Gentiles and taught them God's word, instead of listening to them, they told Paul and Barnabas, no, you're wrong. A Gentile has to be circumcised if he wants to go to heaven. A Gentile has to follow the law of Moses, Acts chapter 15. In verse 5 we see this, but some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. It's amazing how many even in the church when they get to studying and hearing God through his word filter it through the baggage of their past and end up being caught up in the thorns of their past. This baggage, this baggage was costing these Jews their soul. In James 2 and verse 10, he comments on this when he says, For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has begun, become guilty of it all. Our baggage, when we hear God's word through it, instead of the pure, unadulterated word of God, will always end up adding to and taking away, which leads us to, of course, the good hearing. This is that which listens to what God has to say wholeheartedly and seeks to know more, and not bringing about their own baggage and their own ideas, but wants to know truth. These are those that will always be fruitful in the kingdom, Jesus said, both individually and collectively. With three out of the four hearers not fully hearing God's word, but listening in ways that they felt like or wanted to listen, we see that there is a great danger in that, and it's no wonder that Jesus would say, following up the last of his teachings on this in Luke 8 and verse 18, take care then how you hear. Even as he was teaching, there were some there who heard properly, who were good hearers. There were some there who could care less, really, what, that, what Jesus was saying. There were some there who were simply there to get what they could get out of it. If we hear additions and subtractions to God's word, or we place them in his word, then we're in trouble and we're not good hearers. So with that then, how do we make sure we are then hearing God rightly? How do we make sure that as we study God's word and as we hear it preached and as we hear it teach, we can make sure that we are hearing what God wants us to hear? The first thing we need to do is understand that hearing God rightly takes understanding God's word, not just a mere knowledge of God's word, but takes us actually getting into it and knowing what God is saying. In other words, we must hear 
with the understanding, Matthew 15 and verse 10. As Jesus said, and he called the people to him and said to them, hear and understand. This was a problem even as Jesus himself would preach and teach to those around him, even his own disciples sometimes. Even in this parable, they did not understand what God was telling them and had to go to him and say, please explain it further and, and make it more known to us. God wants us to understand what he is saying. But it requires us to put in the effort. As we see throughout the gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it is made abundantly clear by Jesus that if we don't want to take the time and make the time to understand God and rather just want and hear what we want to hear, that's going to happen. Or as Jesus would say of this same parable in Matthew's account in verse 13, 19, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, notice this. The evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. When we refuse to make the effort and take the time to understand what God is teaching us, then the devil will most definitely snatch it away. And we will be most pitiful because of it. But the beauty of God's word is that when we study it, and when we seek to understand it, and when we can read it, and when we can dive into it and understand it, we are told that not only is this not impossible, it is what we ought to be seeking in every way. Ephesians 3 and verse 4, by which when you read and you understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, Paul here says both it's possible to not only read, but understand. And when we read and when we understand God's word, when we put forth that effort to get to know what God is actually saying, then our eyes will be open. As the proverb writer would say, and so, or the Psalms writer would say in Psalm 119, 18, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. When we understand God's word, and we make the effort to know what he's really saying, what he's teaching, what he wants us to know. When we listen to him through his word, our eyes will be open. Because as Jesus would say in John 8, 32, we can and will know the truth if we want to. If we're willing to put forth the effort and to open our heart to what God wants and to remove our baggage and to get away and remove all those filters that would lead us into adding or subtracting from his word our desires and our wants versus what God wants and what he's saying. Once we get rid of all that and we get past all that and we just get into his word, our eyes will truly be open and we will know the truth. And it is here when our eyes are open and we know the truth that we find it is far harder for anyone including our own selves, to lead us astray by adding or subtracting to what God has taught. Because we will not just have a basic knowledge of God's word, we will have an understanding, a knowledge based in wisdom. And what a beautiful thing that is. We also find that if we want to hear God's word properly, there's something else we need to do, and that's take eagerness and discernment. Hearing God rightly takes eagerness and discernment. What do I mean by that? One of the reasons people get caught up in false teachings is because they simply aren't eager to discern the truth. As we just talked about and read, if we want to know the truth, we can know the truth, but it takes effort. It takes an earnest desire and eagerness to get into it. And yet far too many Christians become one of the first three hearers instead of the good hearer of God's word because they don't have an eagerness to discern the truth that God wants them to know. 
This is what makes the Bereans so special there in Acts chapter 17. Here we have but yet a simple little quiet snippet but beautiful jewel within God's word. The Thessalonians right before that as Luke would write it, they had heard what Paul and Timothy and the others had been preaching and upon hearing it, they believed and they obeyed the gospel. We even read that in 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, that their faith had gone throughout the entire world. That they had heard the world, that the persecution that they had gone through and what they had heard and what they had believed, they were holding true and being faithful. But as Paul left there and he went to Berea and he came to another group of people and he began teaching them the Bereans were not like the Thessalonians they did not simply accept what Paul was saying no in Acts chapter 17 and verse 11 we read this now these Jews or Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica they received the word with all eagerness examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. That word examining, as we've talked about before, means to scrutinize. They were more noble than those of Thessalonica. Not because they believed it differently or obeyed a different gospel, but because once they heard what Paul had to say, and once they heard about the gospel, they didn't just say, well, I'm going to accept some man's version of that. I'm going to accept what this man is telling me. No, they went to God's word and they scrutinized it to make sure or prove that Paul was right. That he hadn't led them astray. Now, it's not that simply taking a preacher's word for it or a teacher's word for it is wrong in and of itself. There's nothing wrong, for example, in this lesson or with someone's teaching to say, to take what the preacher or the teacher is saying and, and to learn from that. There's nothing wrong for, of that, with that. But to only take what the preacher or the teacher is saying concerning God's word and to not get into God's word, to know the truth yourself, that's not going to benefit you. There's nothing wrong, again, listening to a preacher or a teacher, but we can be led astray by men. And no man is perfect. No preacher, no teacher, no elder. No person is perfect. Why? Why is it so important, then, to be like the Bereans in this case? Because their eagerness to know truth their eagerness to know what was really right and really wrong led them to discern between good and evil, as the Hebrew writer would tell those of the Hebrew people writing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. They were lacking. They were the, disinter or the, uh, the ones who had not got past the milk you need milk, not solid food, he said, for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. Notice 14, but solid food is for the mature, for those who have the powers of discernment, trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. We have to get into God's word. If we want to be hearing God as we should, we have to go with eagerness into his word and be able to discern what he has taught us. If we only listen to preachers and teachers, we certainly have not handled rightly the word of God because no man is perfect. So if we want to be good hearers of God's word, we must understand it takes eagerness and discernment, but it also takes a meek spirit. A meek spirit, as we talked about this morning in Bible class, that word meek means to tame the wild animal. To be able to take a wild animal and train them to not be wild anymore, to tame that, not to uh, extinguish their zeal and what makes them uh, exciting and all the things about it, but to tame the wildness 
that is within them. As human beings who obey the gospel, we must tame, of course, our fleshly desires and humble ourselves if we want to do what is right. But we have to do the same thing if we want God's word only in our lives. Remember what James would say in James chapter 1 and verse 21, Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and notice, receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. We cannot hear God properly if we have not tamed those things in our lives that lead us away from God, that would make us add to or subtract from his word because of what we want and we desire and we want to put into his word. It is humble and humility that allows us in that meekness to hear and be glad. Psalm 34 and verse 2. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. <clears throat> Hearing God rightly takes understanding. It takes getting into God's word and knowing what he says. It takes an eagerness to discern what is being taught so that we know what is right and wrong and good and evil. And it takes a meek spirit of accepting God's word and not adding to or subtracting from what he has said to fulfill our own lusts and desires, our fleshly things in this life. As we do our personal Bible study and as we listen to God's word through teachers and preachers, let us hear what God is saying. Let us listen to him. Let us make sure that we are never putting waves of additions and subtractions into what God is saying just to satisfy our own ears, our own wants, our own desires. Rather, let us hear God speak to us through his holy word. As you read your scripture daily, as you read God's word daily, that is him speaking to you, isn't it? That is what he gave us to communicate with us so that we may know him. That we may know his love for us and what it takes to be with him for eternity. Let us not damage. Let us not try in a weak and fable attempt to correct God and his word with our own baggage and our own thoughts. Let us be good hearers of his word. This evening, as you reflect upon your walk with God, as you think about your study and you think about the things in which you get involved with, when it comes to God, I pray that everything that you do is filth or has no filters other than God's in it. It's not always easy, and that's one of the reasons God has each of us hold each other accountable. That we talk to each other and we know what we believe and teach. That we examine ourselves and each other to help each other get to heaven so that we can bear those burdens where they come up. If tonight you're in need of us to bear your burden, you're in need of us to encourage you and strengthen you, or you're in need of us to study with you and help you better know God's word and his truth, let us help you tonight. Let us be what you need. Let us be the church and let us show our love by coming forward and letting us know as we stand and as we sing.